Hello, and we are so happy that you have joined with us today uh, for Harlandale Christian Church, our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, we're certainly glad that you're joining us online, even as we are also sharing together in our in-person, on-campus worship service. We're glad that you are here to worship our Lord, our God and Father in heaven together with us. And even in, in, as that song that we just shared uh, says, we, work, we welcome you, O God, in praise and with praise. The psalmist says in Psalm 130 some, the same things. He says, in, beginning with the first verse, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. And so we all today put our hope and our trust in our God and our Father in heaven as we praise him. Let's go to him together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, 
uh, the, the words of this hymn, this song, and the words of the psalmist that remind us that we are here to worship you. We are here to praise you because you are wonderful, you are uh, mighty, and you, you love us, and we love you. So, Father, we do, uh, we wait upon you, and we put our, our hope and our trust in you and in your word. So bless us today, Father, as we lift up your name. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for this time of fellowship that we have, not only with each other, but with you through your spirit. And thank you for your word that gives us the hope of life eternal through your son, Jesus Christ. Bless us, Father. We praise you. We lift up your name in Jesus' name. Amen.
And what a joy it is, what a comfort it is to know that we have such everlasting peace in our God, our Father in heaven, and our Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And now as we come to the time in our service when we participate in our communion and offering meditation, a time that we remember the sacrifice that was made for our sins, and then we give back to God through his church here of what he has given to us. Let's meditate upon these things. Imagine yourself alone in a hotel room in a city that uh, you don't know anyone and you're suffering from chest pain, a lot of chest pain. First, there's the denial. Oh, it can't be. I've taken an acid. Maybe it'll go, to, go away. You know better, but you don't want it to be heart trouble. That's serious, but maybe the pain will go away, but it doesn't go away. It gets worse. You have to make a decision. Risk your life or put up with the inconvenience of a hospital trip. Maybe you could just drive. Finally, you call the hotel clerk. Somebody has to tell the paramedics where your room is. The hotel staff responds, and in the distance you hear sirens, and you know that this time the sirens are for you. They place you in the ambulance. You quickly notice that, that everyone except the hotel clerk, who is not a medical professional, is very reassuring and comforting to you. Everything will be fine. This, of course, is the best indicator that things are very serious. You spend the next few minutes staring up at the roof of the ambulance thinking, why don't they put a sunroof in these things? I'm supposed to be able to see where I'm going. And then you arrive at the hospital and enter the air of medicine, people and paraphernalia that are unique to the world of the hospital. Up until now, you've had activity to occupy your mind. Now you wait. You'd really like to be bored waiting, thinking that, meant that, thinking that that meant it's not really serious. But the doctor is prompt. Matters are severe. A surgical suite is prepared for you. Now think about this. Sin is so much like that. We don't want to admit it. We'll try our own remedy for a while. Things get worse until you finally appeal for help. The help comes in the form of people who don't want to alarm you, but it's serious. It's not a matter of life and death. It's more serious than that. It's a matter of heaven and hell. So your friends carry you to the one person who can help, the great physician who alone holds the keys to heaven and hell. He has done what needs to be done. It simply needs to be applied to you. He's the one who made the sacrifice at the cross of Calvary that atones for your sin. Communion is the reminder of that fact. It's also the continuing treatment of our sin. So let's examine ourselves. Do not stay in uh, de denial. Seek help. You might not see where you're going with this, but Christ does. Enter into fellowship with Jesus Christ and receive his healing. Remember how serious you discovered sin to be? Remember how great a salvation you received. And remember that and thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the forgiveness, for the healing from our sins. Our communion song today is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We'll partake of the emblems, the bread and the juice as we sing this song. And then in person we'll uh, share in our offering. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for being our great physician, for giving your only begotten Son to be able to save us, and heal us from the, the, the disease and the problems of our sin. We thank you, Father, for giving us the, this reminder of your love and that great love of your Son our Lamb of God. 
Father, we thank you that we have such a friend in Jesus and his love and your grace. Help us to draw near to you in this time of communion as we do this in remembrance of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. called to hear or do are we asked to hear the message or to do the word and the will of God James in the first chapter of his letter beginning with verse 16 says don't be deceived my dear brothers and sisters every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created my dear brothers and sisters take note of this Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word that's planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, 
they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I read about a certain Chinese church where when converts were baptized for the forgiveness of sins, when they came up out of the water, they were told, now Jesus has new eyes, Jesus has new hands, and Jesus has new feet. When we became Christians, we became the eyes and the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. We became extensions of Christ. And we now represent Jesus. And when people see us, they should see Jesus in us. That's kind of what James is saying here in our, here in our text this morning. God brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James 1, 18. God saved us so that we could be first fruits, so that we could be examples to others of what it means to be a Christian. But now the problem here is that that doesn't always work out real well. Christians don't always reflect uh, the image of Jesus as well as we'd like to or as, as well as we should. And one of the main reasons that Christians fail to do this is because they've listened to some false information, some fake news, and followed some false models. This sermon series that we're in right now, where we're looking at uh, this month we're, that we're calling fake news, Remember, we're not talking about political fake news or about politicians and the news media where a lot of that uh, reference is with that term. Instead, we're talking about spiritual fake news. Fake news and false teaching that often Ill infiltrates the church and it warps Christians. Last week, we talked about fake news called the prosperity gospel. It's a heresy, it's a false teaching that teaches people false things about God and his promises. But that kind of heresy comes from the outside. The prosperity teachers flood us with DVDs and books and TV programs that teach people how to manipulate God so that they can get health and wealth and whatever else. But frankly, most people don't need any help trying to manipulate God. They're really good at this type of thing all on their own. People have been doing this type of thing for centuries and not just in the church. You realize that pagan religions thrive on getting their God to do what they want done if they manipulate that God enough for their needs. And that kind of leads us into this second part of the first uh, chapter of James where we hear or do why do people try to manipulate God and how do they try to manipulate God why do they tend to make their relationship with God all about themselves well I can think of at least two reasons that happens the first is that we're all really kind of selfish we tend to focus on ourselves first. Some time back, in fact, I read in, it was in about 2006, the Washington, Washington, Washington Post had a poll that showed that 79% of Americans believed that they were above average in appearance, and 86% felt that they were above average in intelligence. Um, wait a minute. What's average? 50%, right? So this high percentage of people felt that they were above 50% of the rest of the population. Eh, go figure. Some of these folks must have a vastly exaggerated view of their good looks and their own intelligence. But here's the deal. 
When people think like that, it's not hard for them to think that church and their relationship with God is all about them. I want what I want because I deserve what I want. I'm better than the average person. And so God should give me better. He should give me more. He should treat me better as one of his children. Wow. Well, the second reason that I think people can think their relationship with God is all about themselves is because that's how we treat them. When they first walk in the door, or when they first are baptized into Jesus Christ, we bring them in, we pamper them, we try not to upset them, and we tend to feel like it's kind of our fault if they leave. Thus, they can get very self-centered. Uh, uh, back in the, I think it was back in the 80s, Amy Grant, you might remember and recognize that name, she had a song called Fat Baby about that kind of thing that she sang. Now, this trims down the words a little bit, but here's part of what she sang. I know a man, maybe you know him too. You never can tell, he might even be you. His spiritual tummy can't take too much. One day a week, he gets a spiritual lunch. On Sunday, he puts on his spiritual best and gives his language a spiritual rest. He's just a fat, fat little baby. He wants his bottle, and he don't mean maybe. He's been baptized, sanctified, redeemed by the blood, but his daily devotions are stuck in the mud. He knows the books of the Bible in John 3.16. He's got the biggest King James that you've ever seen. But he's just a fat, fat little baby. Now think about it. That's what pampered and coddled Christians look like. Fat little babies. And do you know what babies do when they don't get what they want? When they want it? They cry, they fuss, and they pitch a fit. And that's what happens to Christians who don't grow up. They think the church is all about them, and so they manipulate things. And if they don't get their way, they'll pitch a fit. And James says in James 1, to 25, don't do that. Don't go there. Grow up. More accurately, the verses say, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For when he looks at himself and then goes away and at once he forgets what he look, was like, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres being no hearer, but for, who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And so what James is saying in a paraphrase is quit sitting there. Just quit sitting there waiting to be fed and wanting to be fed. Now, I am, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad that you're listening to us online. At least I have someone to talk to. But if all you end up doing is not doing then you're going to end up being just like Amy Grant's fat little baby, just hearing and feeding. So the, question, so the question becomes, how can I go from what James calls a hearer to become a doer? Well, I know this can be a pretty complicated thing, so I did a, a study of the Greek here, and that word doer in the Greek means are you ready for this? Someone who does something. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> That's, it's that simple. You don't have to thank me, it's just part of the job of being able to search these things out for you. We as Christians are to be doers. Someone who does something. You see, when churches do their jobs right, that's what people, the church, 
Christians do. They do things because they've been trained from the very beginning to serve. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, everyone then who hears these words of mine, and do you know what's next? Does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock in Matthew 7, 24 and 25. It's very simple. Once you hear the words of Jesus, then you do them. You don't wait until you know more or if you've grown more you do it then. And this is where the term or the thinking of the false, the false news, the false teachers might come in. Because we have so many who say, all you have to do is listen to my TV message, listen to my word, and pray a prayer, and read my book, watch my DVD, and God saves you. A young man was baptized into Jesus Christ, and, about a, and a, a couple of months later, his Sunday school teacher asked him, what have you done for Christ since you were baptized, since you believed? And the boy answered, oh, I can't do anything. I'm still a learner. Oh, replied the teacher. Well, when you light a candle, do you light it to make the candle more comfortable or to have it give light? Well, to give light, the boy said. Well, the teacher said and continued, and, and do you expect it to give light after it's half burned or when, or when you first light it? And the boy answered, as soon as I've lit it. Very good, the teacher said. So go and do likewise and begin at once. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, in Matthew 5. In other words, Jesus is saying, do it now. The candle is lit. Do something. But what should you do? Well, as we move through this pandemic time, we are talking about being able to come back to we're, we're happy that we're able to be back in in-person worship at this point we are talking about being able to have in-person bible study and sunday school classes when uh, everything is safe and we're uh, comfortable again maybe you can host uh, in-home bible study you don't have to teach just host it one of us could assist you with teaching invite a few folks over and supply the food and i could find all kinds of people to come over i think and they'll teach as long as you feed them do you think that only the elders and deacons and minister do anything at church do you know what elders are supposed to do they're supposed to watch over the flock and help meet their needs maybe you could grow into that and become and do that if you know someone hasn't been in church for a couple of weeks, you could call them, text them, write them a letter, tell them you missed them. If you know someone who's been in the hospital, you could go visit them when it's safe or at least give them a message and let them know. Are, you, are they homebound? You could call them, chat for a little while, or maybe even take them something to eat. You know, I am so happy. I, I am, I'm proud of you folks here at Harlandale because you do that stuff anyway. We're small. We're, we're few in number, but I am so proud. And, and I praise God for what you do for each other. And, and whether it's Barbara or others sharing a praise or a prayer request on, on the uh, phone and text line, we pray for each other or just sharing our lives, making a phone call, lifting each other up. The point is, you don't need a Bible college degree or a fancy title to do stuff for Jesus. You just have to do what little you can, and that may be just what needs to be, needs to be done. I read that in World War II, Allied bombers 
returned to their base and told a miraculous story. They'd been hit several times by German anti-aircraft gunners, but none of the shells had exploded. Specialists carefully removed the shells and took them to a safe place to examine them. And, when they, f and they found that those German shells contained no firing pins. Where the firing mechanism should have been was a note written in Czech, apparently by one of the slave workers in a German munitions factory. In English, it said, this is all we can do for now. Wish we could do more. They didn't think they were doing enough, but for the crew of that plane, they had done a powerful and impressive thing. They did what little they could, and that made all the difference. That's what Jesus is asking for you and for me. You don't have to do everything, but that one small thing you do for him and for one of his children can make all the difference. Now, one last thought. It's not enough to just do stuff. You need to do your stuff for Jesus. And that's really what James is telling us here. Because he says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and then he goes away and, once, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer but who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. You know, it took me a little bit to figure out what James was really saying here. And I wondered, what is this all about? What's this about a hearer, not the doer, looking at, the, looking at himself in the mirror and then walking away? And then it occurred to me what James was saying when most of us wake up each morning, we have a ritual that we go through. My ritual is to get up, take a shower, comb my hair, don't laugh, I still have hair to comb, shave, brush my teeth, and then uh, uh, during the work week, begin my uh, work with my, my full-time job. Every once in a while, my schedule gets interrupted with a text or an email or something and so or somebody will call early in my morning and and they want to talk for 15 20 minutes and I'll go out into the the kitchen and sit down for a little bit and talk to them and then I'll remember something I'll look I want to look up on the, on the computer or I'll start making myself breakfast or I'll I'll rub my chin and I realize hey I forgot to shave or I forgot to brush my teeth because I got distracted and I know you don't want to be around me when I haven't brushed my teeth I looked in the mirror after my shower and I combed my hair but then I walked away having forgotten to do the rest of my morning ritual that's what James is talking about here those who only hear the word and don't do it walk away having forgotten to finish the job. They, they, they haven't finished making themselves ready. But the real doers won't give up until they've done what Jesus wants done. The real doers look in the mirror and they're not satisfied until they've changed something. Those who only hear the word or like those folks you see down at Walmart still walking around in their pajamas. Life for the hearer is all about themselves. In another community many years ago when I preached, there was a denominational church that had a very impressive choir. It was one of those things that it was considered to be an honor to be a part of that choir. And that choir would often go to other churches to put on concerts. And they even went to other areas, cities and states on a singing tour occasionally. But every once in a while, the church board or the preacher would have a problem with how the group was being run. And then board members would lose their jobs and preachers would be fired. Why? Because the folks who led that choir 
weren't doing what they did for Jesus. It was all about them. It was their agenda and their glory that was the most important thing. And may God have mercy on the church leader who didn't bow to their will. But you know, that's the difference between a hearer who doesn't do for Jesus and a true doer for Jesus. So let me close with a story about a true doer. He lived back in the 1800s, and ever since he'd been a boy, he dreamed of being a missionary to Africa. It was a driving passion for him. And then he met a girl who had the same dream as he had, and they got married. And they were faithful members of their church, and they were constantly sharing Jesus with others. And they planned and saved for their ultimate journey into ministry and missionary work. And then his wife took sick. It was soon obvious that she was not going to be strong enough to endure the hardship of life in a foreign country. And sadly, the young man had to give up his dream. Not sure what to do, he eventually went to work for his father, a dentist with a small side business. As his dad grew older, the young man took over that side business and found that he had a skill at marketing their product. And as the business grew, it struck him that maybe he could still help on the mission field. And so he determined to build up the business with an eye toward using his income to financially support overseas mission work. He worked hard and he eventually built the company into a huge enterprise where the product became world famous and was sold in practically every grocery store and supermarket. Wait. I haven't told you what that side business was, have I? The business he took over from his dad was, present, was producing unfermented wine for churches to use in communion. Grape juice. Do you think you might know what that young man's name was? That's right, Welch, as in Welch's grape juice. Thomas Welch. Over the years, that business has supplied to support uh, to hundreds of missionaries who've accomplished more on the mission field than he could have ever done by himself. And like I said, I'm proud of Harlandale. I'm proud of this congregation. It's been said that in many churches, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. Not here. It's more like over 50%. And of course, yes, we are small and everybody has a part. Most of you are doing the work. Many, if not all, are doing part of the work. And that's great. But should we be satisfied with only a part of doing things for Jesus? Of course not. Every Christian ought to be doing what they do for Jesus every day everything for Jesus. So this sermon is all about getting the rest of us out on the pier and then shoving you, shoving you off into the water. You don't have to do everything, but you need to do something for Christ. Just get your feet wet. But it won't do you any good to get your feet wet until you get the rest of you wet over here in the baptistry. That's why we have an invitation at the end of every service a time of de decision and dedication, a time to give ourselves, our hearts, our lives to Jesus Christ and accept his forgiveness for our sins or to rededicate ourselves to him so that we would be doers of his word. Our song of dedication today is the power of your love. And you know that we show the power of Jesus' love in us when we are doers of his word every day. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we've had to be able to worship you together, that we have had this time to share in communion and fellowship with you and with each other and to study your word. 
And Father, I pray that you will help us to not just be hearers and readers of your word, but through your grace, through your mercy, through your strength, we will be doers and everyone around us will see you in us. Show your power in us, our Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. in